All right, so this is the first video in my series on how to use IndexedDB without a library. So I want to get into the core concepts of IndexedDB and actually build something using all of these different objects and interfaces that we have in IndexedDB. So what I'm going to build over the series of this video is just a very simple interface. I'm going to have a form where I can add things, update things, delete things. I'm going to be generating a list of contents, so reading data from the database and writing it out on the page. So what is the benefit of IndexedDB over something, say, local storage? The number one thing with IndexedDB is that we can use it in service workers. That means that I can access the same database from my web page as well as a service worker that is connected to my page. That means if I'm building a progressive web app, I have a place that I can store data. Now, databases, local storage, cached content, those can all be cleared out. And some browsers, namely Safari, will actually clear that content out from your website. So after seven to 14 days, Safari on iOS will actually delete local storage, IndexedDB, and content. I'm going to be doing a series on service workers and then on progressive web apps. And in that series, I'm going to be talking about how we can install a progressive web app. And that is going to protect our IndexedDB so that we can actually have sort of permanent storage for our application. All right, so let's get into IndexedDB. We've got a bunch of core concepts. So there's the index DB object itself. This represents the database. Inside a database, we're going to have a series of stores. Or if you're familiar with other document databases, you may be familiar with the concept of collections. So we have multiple collections inside of a database. Each collection or each store is a group of JavaScript objects. Each of those objects you can call a document. That's why the term document database or where it came from. We're going to be working with IndexedDB. We're going to be creating multiple stores inside of our databases. We're going to be dealing with the store objects. Mm -hmm. Request objects. This is a core feature um, with IndexedDB. We don't actually directly interface with the database. We don't do insert, update, and delete like you would with a, um, a relational database. What we do is we create requests. We send those requests off. It's an asynchronous thing. And we say, here, please attempt to do this. And we're going to get back a response. So we provide callback functions for when those operations are complete. Transactions are wrappers around requests. So even if you've only got one request, let's say I wanted to add some data into my index DB. I still have to have a transaction wrapped around that. And the transaction is the container that carries our requests to the database. Now, a transaction could be a whole series of things. A common example of this would be, um, think of a bank machine um, or think of your online banking access. You want to send an e-transfer to somebody. Okay, well, there's a series of steps. First, you have to check the balance in the person's account to see if they have enough to transfer it. Then you have to pull the money out of the account. Then you have to actually send it to the other account and then put it into that other account. Now, what happens if the process is interrupted part way? Let's say after the point where it checks your balance and withdraws the money, then something goes wrong. The power cuts off on the server. Now you've lost the money and the other person doesn't have it either. So a transaction would wrap this whole process of all this series of requests, keeps it all together. And if it doesn't finish the whole thing, then it doesn't commit that change. It doesn't make it a permanent change. So those are transactions. Indexes are a way to efficiently work with the data. So you can sort it based on different properties within your objects. If you are always going to be accessing things and say, I always want to look for things based on this property, you could create an index on that property to help you do that more efficiently. Cursors, if you are working with a bunch of data, let's say you've done a request to get back and read all the data from a certain uh, collection or a certain store, 
and you want to step through that one at a time, the cursor is the object that lets you keep track of the current position and it can automatically feed you the next record in that collection. The key range is when you're doing a search on an index, I want to know, okay, find everything that matches this record or find everything that matches these values. So a range of possible values. Okay, so that's the overview of IndexedDB. Let's jump into some actual code. Now I've built this simple page here. I've just got uh, an empty script right here. I've got an iffy and inside here, what I want to do is I want to actually create a new database. So on my page right now in the browser, if I go over to the application tab in the tools, we have a section called IndexedDB. And right now there's nothing in there. I can refresh this. There is nothing there. If I want to open a IndexedDB, there is a command that I can use for doing this. We can say IndexedDB, that's the root object that's inside the window. So we can say either window.indexedDB or just IndexedDB, and then we call open. Now with this, we need two things. One is the name of the database that I want to open, and if it doesn't exist yet, it will create it. So I'm going to create one called WhiskeyDB, and then the version number is optional. If I don't put it in there, it's going to be considered to be zero, but this is going to be a, um, an integer value that we are going to use to represent which version of the database. Anytime that you want to make a change to the database, to the stores that are inside of it, to the structure of the database, you want to create a new index or something like that you need to increment the version and say, okay, I'm making a change structurally to my database, to the stores, I'm adding a new store. Then we have to change the version number. I'm just gonna say one. We're gonna start off with version one. And when we do this, I'll save this. There we are. Inside the application tab, we can see in the, under index DB, it has actually created this. It tells me this is my version number and object stores, there are zero right now. This is our first example of a request. So I'm making a database open request. And I'm just going to, now that I have that object created, uncomment all these things. These are placeholder functions. There's an error event, a success event, and an upgrade needed event. So these are three events that we're always going to want to have within our code. Anytime I change this version number, it will trigger this upgrade needed event. Every time I open the database and it works, it's going to trigger success. This is regardless of whether or not I've changed the version number. So this will always happen. So let's come in here. We'll say console.log and we'll say success. That should be a string. There we go. We'll come inside here. Console.log upgrade. Okay, so we've got an error. If something goes wrong opening or creating the database, we have success, which is we've either finished opening it or we've upgraded it and opened it. And then upgrade is when we're changing the version number. So right now, hopefully all I will see is my success. So there it is, version one, refresh. Yeah, nothing changes here, go into console. And there it is, there's our success event. And let's zoom in a little bit here for you. Success showing, here's the database object. This is my variable DB. It has a property called object store names. This is all of the stores or all the collections that we would have created inside of there. Currently we don't have any, so the length of this is zero. It's just gonna be a string of names, just kind of like a, if you've ever worked with the DOM and you've ever worked with the class list property, it is also a DOM string list. It's just a list of names. Okay, so we've got back in the application here. There we are, no stores. So I wanna create a store. How do I do that? Well, inside the upgrade needed, this is the only place where you can actually create a database store. Okay, if I want to create one right here, because I'm only going to be working with one, I've created a global variable 
to store the name of the store that I'm going to create. If I was going to do multiple ones, I could have variables for that. This is really just a convenience thing for me. I can always determine the names later on, but just for convenience sake, later on in my code, I'm going to want to know what the name is that I created. So right here, we're going to say that object store is going to be equal to db. That is our database object that we created. And we're going to say create object store. And we can provide, at a minimum, a name. So we could do just that. There is an options object here that we can add in as well. The options object has a couple of things. The one thing that I typically use when I'm creating a new store is a property called key path. This is going to be inside the objects that I'm actually going to be inserting into my store. Which property in those objects do I want to use as the key? So the unique value for each one of these things. And I'm going to use the ID. So I don't have to specify right now what properties I'm going to put in there. I can put any object with any properties I want into my store, but I'm going to always require myself to have a property called ID. And this is going to be the unique value. There is another option here. I can set the auto generate property to be true. And if I do that, it means I'm giving over control to the index DB to actually create those indexes. So it's going to be numerical indexes that it creates. I prefer to generate my own IDs. So this is what I'm going to do in the future. I will be using this as the unique value for each one of my objects. It doesn't have to be ID. It can be anything that I want. But there we go. I've created now an object store. And I'm doing this when this change occurs. All right, so I save that. I come back. I'm still on version one. Here's my database. I don't have a store yet. It hasn't created a store inside my database. So let's go back here and change the version number. We'll increment, we'll go up to version two. When I save that, it's going to trigger the upgrade, which is going to create this store. And then it will do the success after it does the upgrade. And there it is. Now we have the store created and version two, we can see there's the version. We have one store in here. If I click on the store, we get to see there is a column in here for the index number for each one of the entries that I make. So zero, one, two, three, just like an array, the key path, this is going to be the ID. If I shrink it down a little bit, there it is. The ID is going to be the unique value. The value, these are the objects that I'm going to be inserting into my store. And it's going to look inside of each one of these for a property called ID, and it will write it here as well for me. Okay, so we've created a store now. That's great. There's a store called Whiskey Store. If I were now to increment this number again, save it, I'm going to get an error. We've got an error happening here. And the error is it can't create object store again because it already exists. So we need to test and see, hey, do we already have this thing? And you can see my error event also happened because of this failure. So there was a failure here, and then it also triggered the error on the DB open request. So how do I do this? How do I protect myself and only do this if that doesn't exist? So there's very, it's very possible that at some point I want to create another store. I'm going to change this version number again. There's, I want to add an index or do something else. So I don't want to run this line of code and cause an error. So we will come in here and we will check to see, Hey, you know what? The object store list that we had, is that going to contain this one? So if not db dot object store names, and this because this is a DOM string list, 
we can use the contains method and say, hey, if you don't already have something called whiskey store, so if it doesn't contain this, create it. There we go. And we'll close our if statement. Up. Move those in. Save that. Now we don't get the error, but we do get the upgrade and the success. Those two functions did run, but we don't have the error now because we did the check to make sure, hey, this thing doesn't exist yet. So we're going to come back and look at this again when we talk about indexes. Some other things that we have available to us inside of here. We could take a look at the current version. We can take a look at the old version to find out what those are. So there is a property, let's say we'll create one called old version. There's a property on the event. So this event being passed in here, it has a property called old version. And there's another one called new version. And this one is the same thing as on the database, there's a property called version. It is the same as the event new version. So I'm checking, hey, if this one doesn't exist, check to this one, but really they are the same value. They're pointing at the same property. And we're gonna say database upgrade updated from version old version to new version. There we go. So every time there's an update now, we're going to get this message about what version we went from and to. So if I jump here to version four and save that, there we go. Database updated from version three to version four. Now, if for some reason you need to delete a store that you've got, we also have the ability to do that. So we can check and see if DB object store names contains foobar, we can remove that. Just like that. So we've got a create object store. There's a delete object store as well. So if it contains foobar, right now it doesn't. So let's create that. We'll say DB create object store. We'll run this once just so that we do create it. I'm going to comment out these three lines so they don't run yet. All right. And we'll have to increment our version to make this code run. So let's jump to version five. We'll come down here. So in version five, we're going to create another store called FUBAR. Let's jump over to our application. And there it is, there's foobar. We've created foobar. We haven't given it a key, a key path rather, like we did here, but it does exist. Now I'm gonna comment this one out and uncomment these just to show that this does work. I'm gonna come up and we'll increment again to trigger that code in the update. And there we go. We can see that foobar, that store was removed. Okay, and so that's everything that you need to know about how to create your database, create the stores inside of them, look at the versions, and handle any versioning that you want to do. So if you want to add or remove, you have to trigger an update to be able to do that. None of this stuff, the create object store, delete object store, none of that is going to work inside of here. You will get errors if you try to run that code inside success. It can only be done inside the upgrade needed event. All right, so if you have any questions about that basic uh, structure for creating, opening, upgrading the version, please leave those in the comments down below. I'll answer as many as I have time for. So keep an eye out for the rest of the videos in this series about IndexedDB. I'm gonna be going through looking at all the different parts, the transaction, trans, transactions, the requests, the indexes, the cursors, all those things so that you can do anything that you need to with the data inside your IndexedDB. And as always, thanks for watching.